Welcome to the uh, MVME Express uh, session on rota MVME for rotational media. Uh, my esteemed colleague from WD will be presenting as well. And then also Kim Malone will be presenting uh, later after this session on uh, computational storage and some of the advances we've, we've made there. If you uh, look at what's recently happened with respect to MVME, I think everyone, at least in this audience, is aware there's been a lot of advances within MVME, a lot of feature sets that continue to be added on MVME. So we, I guess we started this journey a couple years ago, really internally and talking to customers and others about, you know, could there be a consolidation of the interfaces? Could we look at seeing what the advantages might be of consolidating some of these architectures, not only at the server level, but at the subsystem level, uh, onto one of the, you know, NVMe, because all the new and significant work that was kind of being done in the industry was being developed around NVMe. So if we take that protocol, what happens when we put it on a hard drive and down to rotational media? <laughs> a, would it work? Because NVMe was designed for SSDs. HDDs have much higher latency than SSDs. They're built for, you know, a million IOPS, SSDs, HDDs, hundreds of IOPS. So would there be any issues? And in our early experiments, we didn't see any issues with, with the protocol itself. And there was really no barriers that came up initially in our early testing. So we thought, great, let's, let's see what we could do here and, and really why we would do it. So it wasn't about performance. It was about just getting uh, consolidation onto a single interface, which eventually could, could you know, rule a lot of items. You've got PCIe and the NVMe protocol, and uh, yeah, it just made a lot of sense as we move forward. Dave Landsman's gonna cover some of the standards efforts that have been going on in OCP uh, collaboratively with NVMe, and he'll take us into some of the details that we're working there. So if you look at, you know, the first goal that we had was, you know, in a server system, what does it look like? It's really cheap, SATA by ones, directly connected to SATA interface. Can we do the same with NVMe? Yes, by one, keep it very cost sensitive, deploy the, uh, deploy the same architecture that we have in direct server connects uh, today and have an NVMe drive. And really this, this kind of drives all the other architectures is, can we do it cost effectively? Can we drive a single port into NVMe, and also can we utilize uh, some of the same SATA and SAS connectors and SAS backplanes that are used today so that we don't disrupt the, the manufacturing process of the HDDs, right? Anytime you do that, it, it's gonna get really tough. If you look at other technology, other architectures where you need more than one drive, a lot of times you will have a SAS controller and a SAS expander that connects either SAS drives or SATA drives in these architectures. And you can do that more cost effective, effectively with NVMe. You don't need a SAS controller or a SAS expander. You get rid of this software stack. And with the inbox drivers that exist today for Linux and Windows, you can talk directly to an NVMe drive. So you get rid of you know, some of those costs that are, that are being um, currently created today by these architectures. When you move to JBODs, you get a even more cost um, advantage. You can take advantage. You can get rid of your SAS controller that's up in your server, and then you have your JBOD down below, just your bunch of drives, and you can, you know, minimally, there are two SAS expanders in here that support these JBODs, often three, to scale the SATA or SAS drives that are in the JBODs. And with the devices that we have, we can get a PCIe retimer pretty cost effectively to get out of your box. And then we also have a PCIe switch, which has a lot of lane counts now. And getting the PCIe switch guys who already support, some of them already support by one bifurcation in their switch, you can connect up drives in a single lane. And for HDD, all we really need is Gen 3, right? You don't need a lot of bandwidth. 
Gen 4 eventually, you know, when you start talking about dual actuator drives and other devices that might handle more bandwidth, but really Gen 3 by one is a pretty simple architecture and that's all that's really required to support. Again, this allows us to leverage a drive that either has, you know, that has a SATA connector on it, by one support, basically a SATA type replacement device that can go into these architectures and support the hyperscalers. So the, the HCI architectures today, you know, we've got multiple protocols we're supporting, SATA, SAS, fiber channel. And those architectures are built up either with fiber channel SANS for multiple, you know, JBODs attached, or, you know, SAS and SATA uh, drives either for cost for SATA, or if you need high availability, you've got dual port and serial attached SCSI um, for, for those architectures as you move forward. NVMe really helps simplify this because we've got, we can get rid of all those components that we talked about. We can get rid of the software stack and these, these software components are only provided by a few companies. The stacks kind of lock you into their, through their architecture. So once you pick a vendor, you're kind of locked in. With the NVMe inbox drivers, you're no longer locked in to those, uh, to those software stacks. And then the you know, namespace support for drives, you can now find both your SSDs and your HDDs in these architectures with the same constructs that we use for NVMe. So all your management tools can be leveraged with respect to that and, and other pieces. Now, what NVMe over Fabric does is it really brings a very cost-effective way for us to scale HDD, SSD, and even you know, storage class memories under block across, these, across this interface. You can have uh, your RNIC and your CPU, you can use a low cost RNIC coming through a top of rack switch down into your HDD J bods, your SSD uh, F bods, and storage class memory bods, and all use the same uh, con constructs or implementations that we have for SSDs today. Now the form factors for HDDs are gonna stay the same, so we don't expect you to really see any kind of mix of architectures between SSDs and HDDs, SSDs, you know, two and a half inch form factors is about as large as they get. HDDs, you know, still three inch form factors, so those will stay the same. But what we wanted to ensure is that we could utilize the backplanes that are used in here, which are SAS backplanes today. So you can take a NVMe PCIe drive with a SATA connector, plug it right into that SAS backplane just like we do today, so no changes. Really trying to turn as few knobs as possible to get these architectures launched. Also, with a GPU cluster, you can also access your storage um, via, via RDMA constructs that can come into the drives. We already have RDMA constructs that are built in uh, to the SSDs. Those same constructs can be pushed over into the HDDs, and you can use an RDMA construct to get data placed directly in memory on your drive and utilize that capability here for, uh, for multiple device connect. So it really breaks nothing with what we have today on SAS uh, SSDs and just allows us to get to those HDD devices. As far as composability goes, now that everything's on the same network, same protocol, same connection, we can use, um, you know, there's Kubernetes running at composability layers that allow everything to look the same to these layers that they do at the target level. So the SSDs, HDDs, storage class memories, those, those capabilities and uh, features you can now compose at will and be uh, launched with your containers and utilized independently of having to scale your servers. So it just gives us that, you know, just that ubiquitous interface and management tools and all the other key features that are already being developed on SSDs, storage class memories, and then for HDDs today. Again, we didn't want to increase the cost of these architectures, so that was one of our main goals. Here. Dave? <coughs> Thank <clears throat> you.
All right. <clears throat> so um, as far as standardization activities on uh, NVMe HDD, uh, the, the momentum really got going in about mid-2020 in uh, OCP. Uh, we started uh, as Microsoft and Seagate uh, really launched this and WD came on board and we've been trying to develop a, an OCP NVMe SSD spec. You've been maybe hearing about drive specs from OCP in some of the other sessions uh, today, and there's certainly, uh, and so this is kind of a, a preliminary, you know, the drive specs that are out there now are kind of for existing products. But so this is kind of a requirements document for a new category of device. <clears throat> and uh, we're at the V0.5 level now and hoping, I'm just putting a stake in the ground that we can finish a, a 1.0 by the end of this year. Um, so that's, so the spec is being done in the storage project at OCP. Can you guys hear me okay? Am I close enough to the mic? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I was stepping back. Okay. So um, what's in the spec? Um, the, as from a standpoint of hardware requirements, we took, as Dave kind of intimated, we took the, um, the approach of if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Try and keep things consistent, keep the cost down. Um, so that an NVMe HDD can, can compete well uh, uh, against SATA and, and uh, SATA drives in particular. So it's a three and a half inch form factor, SFF 8301 and uh, 8323. Um, we stuck with 12 and uh, five volt power as standard in HDDs. Uh, there's a single and dual port uh, configurations uh, anticipated that will be supported. Um, as far as the device connectors, uh, we picked SAS or SATA. We wanted to stick with those, uh, again, to keep costs down. Um, the, you could kind of deploy a, uh, with, with the, when we, we've been doing uh, system, integ uh, system um, signal integrity uh, verification on the connectors, and basically for a lower cost drive where you'd use Gen 3 PCIe speeds, um, a cost optimized drive, you're going to want to stick with SATA or SATA 3 connectors. Um, and because um, the, those lower cost connectors won't quite make it to Gen 4. So if you go to a Gen 4 for a performance skew, um, you'd want a SAS 4 connector at least, on, or a SAS 4 connector on the device and on the host or something like 8639. Um, we also tried to reduce pins, or where, you know, the spec keeps the pin count low. A couple of examples are we're not using uh, PE reset, uh, and we're requiring uh, independent clocking through SRIS. Um, and there's no sideman bus. We're going to do all you know, management and security stuff through uh, PCI VDM. Um, and the feature requirements, I mean, roughly when we start talking, there's a long section in the spec on NVMe feature requirements, and we basically are following the model of the NVMe data center spec. Um, there's some variations we'll make, you know, we'll keep things that are applicable to both HD, uh, HDDs and SSDs like security, both data at rest, security from TCG and attestation, which is becoming really important in all platforms now. Those are things that um, are really shared with the data center SSD spec. Um, and then there are some things that are rotating media specific, like command duration limits, uh, for which is a QoS feature. I'll talk about, about that in a sec. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so as far as NVMe goes, um, the, the main features uh, that we're adding for HDDs, the, the, the first thing was to just get the basic plumbing into the spec. Um, rotational, re really what the, the software, what the host software guys wanted was a bit that said, I want to know I'm talking to a rotational media device, not a, not a non-volatile memory device. So we have rotational media bits for uh, namespaces and endurance groups so that the host knows when it's using either one of these constructs that the storage backing it is rotating. Um, we have rotational media logs, information, you know, um, we're going we're gonna to basically, with an HDD, we'll be mapping endurance groups to actuators, probably, right? So instead of a, a NAND region where you're doing wear leveling over, um, uh, you use endurance groups to do wear leveling over a region, we'll use it, we'll use endurance group construct in NVMe to map actuators. Um, and finally, there's kind of, there's spin-up control. Uh, so the, the basic plumbing for staggered spin-up 
was put into the, uh, uh, the NVMe spec. There's some more work that has to go on there. But, um, and then lastly, um, command duration limits, which is uh, probably known to those of you who are you know, SCSI and uh, ATA experts. It's basically a way to, uh, it's a handshake protocol between host and device that allows as the queue depth grow to keep command classes tagged with, with certain latency characteristics like 100 millisecond latency, 200. It allows you to drive to schedule things. And so we're carrying that over from um, SATA and SCSI into NVMe. This, this work is just starting. Um, the other work that I mentioned above is already done. Uh, okay, and uh, the other the other thing it's not really it's not really in the spec. Am I doing okay on time? Yeah, we'll play. Um, is uh, we we want some kind of staggered spin up solution, right? When NVMe's uh, <laughs> environment and PCIe environment really haven't had to deal with uh, rotating media devices, so um, whether it's mode, you know, whatever, right? As PCIe endpoints are not rotating media, so we want to so we want solutions that can work at the PCIe link layer, perhaps in certain topologies, uh, direct attached, uh, up to you know sophisticated JBODs or or more more expanded topologies where you uh, you need you need an enclosure manager and you need a more a little more sophisticated protocol so we're we've outlined a few solutions we think there's a native PCIe link layer solution based on some power management stuff that the sig did last year and we also think you can implement an MI an NVMe MI solution uh, uh, it will require maybe a it will require a couple of extensions to MI uh, to make this work, but they're not massive. So that's that's kind of it. Um, yeah, that's all the slides we've got. That's our quick overview.